This hearing of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee will come to order. Ambassador Jenkins, uh, former Secretary Fernandez, congratulations on your nominations and my thanks for your willingness to return uh, to the State Department with your demonstrated experience, strength, and commitment to advancing our national interests. I have spoken often of the pivotal foreign policy challenges facing our country and the State Department, and this hearing will be no different. If confirmed, both of you will confront serious issues and challenges and a department in need of repair and rebuilding. I'm heartened by the Biden administration's emphasis on nominating knowledgeable and seasoned leaders with rich foreign policy experience. Ambassador Jenkins, the Undersecretary for Arms Control and International Security is one of the most vital senior positions in the Department of State. Its portfolio ranges from nuclear weapons to terrorism and from non-proliferation to landmines. It requires orchestrating global cooperation with both allies and adversaries on critical issues. As you and I have discussed, I have long been concerned over the way that the Department of Defense has assumed the security assistance mission that should be the exclusive purview of the State Department and the Secretary of State. I greatly respect the service of the men and women in our armed forces and particularly your own 20 years of naval service. But the person delivering assistance to officials of a foreign government should not be wearing a uniform. They should instead have the authority to advance and promote a comprehensive foreign policy vision consistent with our core values. We also discussed the need for the State Department to respect this committee's crucial statutory oversight role over the arms sales process, including when the laws and regulations governing those sales may have been violated. This relationship uh, was poisoned by the last administration. Thus far, the relationship has been much improved, but more work is necessary to create an effective partnership. Make no mistake, one way or another, this committee will conduct effective oversight and I hope and expect that we can depend upon your cooperation. Finally, we stand at a crossroads in our nuclear relationship with Russia and China. We have extended the New START Treaty with Russia for five years. The question is now, where do we go from here? Do we seek deeper reductions in Russian strategic forces? Should we focus on shorter range non-strategic nuclear weapons not covered by New START? Should we focus on engaging China, which although its force structure remains smaller than the United States or Russia, is rapidly modernizing and expanding its nuclear forces? So I look forward to hearing your thoughts on these <coughs> matters today. Mr. Fernandez, if confirmed, I expect that your previous experience as Assistant Secretary for Economic Growth will serve you well. This is vitally important because the last four years have been especially difficult for the bureaus that you have been nominated to lead. They suffered from neglect, a, last, a loss of an institutional experience, and an undervaluing of diplomacy at the highest levels. Um, the former administration uh, never even bothered to nominate an assistant secretary for oceans and international environmental and scientific affairs. Given the sad state of affairs, your first priority, I believe, has to be rebuild the e-bureaus, restore morale, and provide clear leadership. This is especially important because President Biden has elevated the mission of the E-Bureau by prioritizing climate change as a foreign policy imperative. Energy, the environment, economic growth, leadership in all of these arenas is necessary to restore U.S. leadership and successfully combat the climate crisis. If confirmed, you'll also head the economic diplomacy wing at the State Department. I'm interested in hearing about your views on building back better America's economic statecraft toolkit. Economic diplomacy is an absolutely critical domain for competition in the 20, 21st century, and there are many questions to be answered about a strategy for the post-COVID reconstruction of the global economy, as well as how to help poor countries administer vaccines and build resilience to the economic strains brought by the pandemic. I'm particularly interested in your views on Secretary Yellen's proposed $650 billion in special drawing rights and how it promotes global economic stability and growth. And I'd like to understand how you plan to engage on economic sanctions both within the department and in the interagency process. So Ambassador Jenkins and Mr. Fernandez, uh, both of you face steep challenges ahead, but I have no doubt that you're up to the task. 
And with that, we look forward to your testimony and turn to the distinguished ranking member for his opening remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> the two nominations before us today are important and indeed really critical uh, to our nation's foreign policy. I'd first like to start uh, with the nomination to be uh, Under Secretary of State for Arms Control and International Security. For the past few decades, the global threat landscape has been going through a paradigm shift. Unfortunately, many in the West have clung to the notion that we can simply rely on the policies of the past to keep us secure today. Nothing could be further from the truth. In just the last 10 years since the New START Treaty was ratified, the threats facing the United States, its allies, and our collective security have only grown. Russia has completely modernized its nuclear forces and has done so outside existing treaty limits. It, it is growing its nuclear stockpile and is developing new so-called exotic missile delivery systems. In addition, State Department compliance reports have laid out a consistent pattern of Russian non-compliance, also known as cheating, uh, with the majority of the international arms control obligations it has signed. Meanwhile, China is on pace to at least double its nuclear stockpile over the next decade. It has tested more ballistic missiles in 2018 and 19 than the rest of the world combined and is likely engaged in nuclear testing activities. Currently, China is modernizing every element of its nuclear triad, including larger land-based intercontinental ballistic missiles, new ballistic missile submarines, and long-range stealth bombers. And the Department of Defense assesses that China is raising the alert level of much of its nuclear force indefinitely. Combined with a lack of transparency, these actions contribute to potential miscommunication or inadvertent escalation in a conflict, and each of these threats demands immediate attention. Beyond Russia and China, we continue to face mounting threats from other malign actors like Iran and North Korea, who continue to vie for a place on the world stage by advancing their nuclear and missile programs and engaging in proxy and cyber warfare. This arms race encourages other nations to question whether they too need to develop nuclear weapons. Certainly not a pretty picture. In, in the process, it undermine, all of this undermines Cold War, uh, the, the Cold War architecture. The role of the Undersecretary for Arms Control is, as, is our lead negotiator and accountability monitor to keep other countries honest on these issues. This person must not only have a deep level of technical knowledge, but also the skills and wherewithal to sit across the table from leaders of, the, of these nations and push back against empty offers and veiled threats. It is also critical that this administration recognize the interdependence between arms control and nuclear modernization as, explicit, as explicitly codified in the ratification of the New START Treaty. The Obama administration committed to nuclear modernization in order to win ratification of the New START Treaty, but promptly scrapped uh, those promises and abandoned those commitments just a year later. Trust must be rebuilt between Congress and the executive. To rebuild this trust, the Biden administration must commit to a full modernization of the nuclear triad and nuclear weapons complex. This is vital to reassure our allies who have foregone development, uh, developing nuclear weapons and instead rely on our nuclear umbrella that we provide for them. Dismantling our capabilities while our adversaries build their stockpiles is inherently destabilizing and undermines international security. Which brings me to the, to the last, but certainly one of the most important topics for this nominee, the Senate's role in approving arms control agreements and treaties. The Constitution plainly lays out the Senate's role in approving these types of international agreements. I cannot stress enough that any international agreement in the arms control space, including re-entry into a previous agreement, must be put to the Senate for its advice and consent as demanded by the Founding Fathers and our Constitution. And to win consent, the administration should take concrete steps to rebuild the trust previous Congresses have placed in the executive branch. Next, we have the nomination of the Honorable uh, Jose Fernandez to be Under Secretary of State for Economic Growth, Energy, and Environment. Our economy is one of our greatest assets, and we all know economic policy is uh, a crucial part of foreign policy. The United States represents about 4.5% of the world's population, but we account for 22% of the world's economic activity. 
American creativity, innovation, and determination are hallmarks of the U U.S. economic model. And it's not surprising that countries around the world long to duplicate our success. More government spending of borrowed money or of government-appropriated private capital is simply not the answer to our problems or those of other countries. Spending enormous sums at home and abroad in the hope that it will create a better world is not sustainable. Instead, we must carefully define our objectives. Whether it is economic, energy, or environmental policy, we must be advocates of a free market system that resists the temptation to impose a one-size-fits-all solution to these incredibly diverse and difficult issues. Further, how we steward our economy and help other countries develop is important to expanding the rule of law, encouraging compliance to international norms, and pushing back on corruption. We must continue to promote the private sector-driven, market-based economy that has led to the United States and its allies, achieving a level of prosperity for our citizens never before seen in history. It is only through promoting this system that the West will truly be able to offer the world a better alternative to the socialist and parasitic Chinese economic policies and to reinforce the system of fair play rules we, along with other free and democratic countries, have constructed. This is the economic landscape that lies ahead of us. With our allies, we must rise to this challenge. I look forward to hearing from both the witnesses on how they plan to address these very important issues. Thank you, Senator Menendez. Thank you, Senator Risch. Uh, so we'll turn to our two nominees. Um, your full statements will be included in the record. We ask you to summarize them in about five minutes or so so we can have a conversation. And we'll start off with Ambassador Jenkins. Chairman Menendez, Ranking Member Risch, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. I am grateful to President Biden, Vice President Harris, and Secretary Blinken for their trust and faith in nominating me to be Under Secretary of State for Arms Control and International Security. It is a great honor for me to come before this committee. If confirmed, I pledge to work tirelessly for the American people and in close coordination with members of Congress and this committee to advance our shared ideals for this great nation. I would like to thank my mother, Dorothy Jenkins, my family, and my friends and colleagues who have inspired and supported me for so many years. I have been honored to serve the U.S. government as both a civilian and in uniform from working on arms control treaties as a lawyer with the U.S. Arms Control and Disarmament Agency in the 1990s to over 20 years in the U.S. Air Force and Navy Reserves. Most recently, I had the honor of being confirmed to serve as ambassador for the State Department threat reduction programs from 2009 to 2017, working to bring the issues of chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear security front and center. My commitment to public service has always included advancing opportunities for all Americans. In 2017, I founded the nonprofit Women of Color Advancing Peace, Security, and Conflict Transformation in an effort to make sure that our nation's policymakers are engaging in and constitute all of our experts, regardless of race, gender, or background. I am also a professor at Georgetown and George Washington Universities, teaching our future generation of policymakers. If confirmed, I will bring this breadth of experience to bear on the challenges that our country is facing today. An increasingly authoritarian People's Republic of China is pursuing a destabilizing military modernization project and rapid nuclear buildup endangering the international rules-based order and inflaming regional and global tensions. Iran has continued to expand and accelerate its nuclear program and ballistic missile development, in addition to its ongoing support for terrorist groups and violent armed militias. Russia continues to violate arms control agreements and commitments, and we face new cybersecurity and emerging technology threats from our adversaries. Okay. Reducing the risk of war through effective arms control <clears throat> limiting Russian and Chinese nuclear expansion, strengthening our efforts in biosecurity, pursuing accountability for the use of chemical weapons, and promoting a diverse workforce will be among my top priorities if confirmed. We must strengthen deterrence alliance in the Euro-Atlantic and Indo-Pacific to better deter and defend against growing threats. 
we must develop and implement norms of responsible behavior in outer space. We must grapple with advancements in emerging technologies that can threaten strategic stability. If confirmed, I will strive to ensure that arms transfers and security assistance are focused on building value-based security partnerships. I will carefully assess, assess all critical factors, including nonproliferation, arms control, and human rights, and will ensure other key commitments, such as maintaining Israel's qualitative military edge, are upheld. I look forward to working with this committee, if confirmed, to look strategically at how our security assistance authorities are structured and how they are balanced and resourced across the departments of state and defense to ensure that our tools, including our security cooperation agreements, are the most efficient for the U.S. taxpayer and the most effective for U.S. national security. Renewed American leadership, as set out in the administration's interim national security strategic guidance, will be essential to reducing the dangers from chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear weapons and their delivery systems. Further, working with allies and partners, the United States must continue to stand up for an open, interoperable, reliable, and secure internet and stable cyberspace, where international law and voluntary non-binding norms apply to state behavior. You have my commitment that if I am confirmed, I will work in close coordination with you in our efforts to restore Congress's role in formulating foreign policy and to ensure the policies we enact are, are in the greatest interest of our national security of the American people. The interests we face are numerous, but our commitment to our allies and to our American people is rock solid. We have much, to work, much work to do, and I am ready to get started. With that, I welcome your questions, and I look forward to our discussion today. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Mr. Fernandez. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chairman Menendez. Thank you, Ranking Member Rich. Uh, and other members of this committee for the opportunity that you've given me before uh, to appear before you today. Uh, I'd like to take a, a couple of seconds to introduce my family. I am blessed to have a supportive and loving family made up of three remarkable women. Um, all three of them walk the talk of public service, and I'm very proud of them. My wife, Andrea Gabor, is a professor at Baruch College in New York and the author of four books, in addition to being the mother of Sarah and, and Annie. Sarah, who's also here, spent a big chunk of her law school years volunteering at a death penalty clinic and is on her way to a graduate degree in psychology. And not with us, but very much in our thoughts, is our second daughter, Annie, who is pursuing a joint public health and medical degree in California. I couldn't be here without them. So thank you for giving me the, the opportunity to introduce them. I'm honored to come before you as President Biden's nominee for Undersecretary of State for Economic Growth, Energy, and the Environment. I'm grateful for the confidence shown in me by the President and by Secretary Blinken. If confirmed, I will consult frequently with this committee as we work to serve the interests of the American people. Nearly a dozen years ago, in the midst of the Great Recession, I appeared before this committee as the nominee for Assistant Secretary of State for Economic, Energy, and Business Affairs. I come to you today under circumstances that are different from those that we faced in 2009, but the reasons that brought me here have not changed. My family and I left Cuba as refugees in 1967. We were fed in food kitchens uh, by charities and we lost the lease in our first home. But when we settled in New Jersey, in the town next to uh, Union City uh, in Hudson County, we began to rebuild lives that had been upended by revolution, fear, and deprivation. A decade later, uh, a country that owed us nothing uh, had given us scholarships to Dartmouth College and Columbia Law School, where I was challenged and nurtured by educators I will never be able to repay. In short, I have lived the promise of America. I know that trading essential liberties for economic security is a false bargain. And I believe to my core that a humble but confident nation that celebrates its diversity while striving to reach a more perfect union, can inspire others to tackle the existential challenges of our time. With the exception of my four years here as Assistant Secretary, I've practiced commercial law in New York since 1980. I've represented U.S. investors doing business abroad uh, and, and uh, I'm foreign investors operating in the United States. I've advised governments in Africa, Latin America, and elsewhere on pro-growth policies. And unfortunately, over the last year, I've also witnessed how workers and businesses everywhere 
have suffered in economies ravaged by COVID-19. If confirmed, I will advance, seek to advance foreign policy initiatives that will benefit the American people, and particularly our middle class, and I, I will focus on uh, five priorities. My first will be to support the State Department's critical role in, in stopping COVID-19. As Undersecretary, I would work to advance global vaccination, secure critical supply chains, promote economic recovery, and promote effective global systems. My second priority will be to work on environmental and energy policies to accelerate economic growth. President Biden's executive order on tackling the climate crisis has established this goal as a national priority. There is no greater challenge than climate change, and we must work to include all countries in the effort while ensuring that our workers will share in the benefits of the new economy. My third priority will be to ensure that our country will benefit from free, fair, and reciprocal trade. We need to focus on co common goals with our trade partners while working to remove trade irritants. We also need to support American innovation by protecting intellectual property rights overseas and preventing strategic competitors from gaming the system. A fourth uh, priority of mine would be to help maintain American leadership in the digital economy and emerging technologies. U.S. Technolo uh, US technology companies face increasing challenges in maintaining U.S. preeminence in cutting-edge science and technology, and we need to engage diplomatically and with industry stakeholders so that international norms and standards are fair and transparent. Finally, my last task will be to do what I've been doing now for almost 40 years, and that is to facilitate new market opportunities for U.S. firms. Competing in the international arena is a strategic imperative for the United States and an opportunity for our companies and our workers. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Well, thank you both uh, for your testimony. We'll begin a, a series of uh, five-minute rounds for members. And I will, uh, at the beginning, say uh, I have to go to um, introduce two judges to the Judiciary Committee, so uh, it's, I will. Yeah, absolutely. I know you'd be happy to. Don't. <laughs> uh, I, I have no doubt about that. Um, so I'll start off uh, with my questions, then I'll turn to Senator Risch. Uh, I should be back by then, but if not, Senator Risch, if you would acknowledge according to the list that we, we have here. Um, let me um, let me start off uh, with you, uh, Ambassador. Uh, I, I'm I'm I, I'm glad I heard in your. Uh, a statement about your commitment to work with the committee. Um, the leadership of state in the last administration had a very contentious relationship with this committee on arms sales matters. And it was clear that uh, our legitimate statutory oversight role was neither recognized nor respected. So far, Secretary Blinken has fostered a very different relationship that is professional, respectful, and consultative. Will you continue and broaden this relationship on arms sales oversight and will you commit to consult with us regarding policy changes and initiatives and not merely inform us of the, your decisions? Thank you for your question, Senator. Uh, yes, I can confirm that uh, more than happy to consult with you. All right. Um, now, I have been concerned for some time that the Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor Bureau does not have appropriate influence on the arms sales process. The Biden administration seems better disposed to consider the human rights components of arms sales process. I plan to reintroduce my Safeguarding Human Rights and Arms Sales Act, which seeks to reemphasize and enhance DRL's role. Um, I have no ideological uh, uh, prohibition to having U.S. arms be sold abroad. Uh, I have no problem with that. I do have a problem when we sell it to countries that violate human rights or act outside of the international norm and the use of those weapons. So if confirmed, will you enhance DRL's role in the arms sales process? Uh, yes, Senator, what I can certainly say is, as I said in my statement, uh, I view human rights as uh, forefront and fundamental in arms sales and arm transfers. So I will certainly do what I can if I'm confirmed at state to include all issues and individuals uh, in terms of promoting human rights. Now, um, I want to turn to uh, uh, the question um, that I raised earlier, and I think you and I had an opportunity to discuss this. As I mentioned in my opening remarks, DOD has reproduced more 
uh, and more of state security assistance authority. It has recently attempted to reproduce state's uh, international military education and training program with a focus on its own priorities as it has done with other duplicated programs. It essentially runs its own foreign military financing grant program, which is considered far more flexible than states. If confirmed, will you give equal focus to all the issues in all of the bureaus and offices under your supervision and actively defend states' equities and authorities in this regard? Uh, thank you, Senator. Yes, I'm very concerned uh, and would certainly be working with all the authorities and the offices within state and interagency uh, to strengthen the role of the State Department in this issue. All right. Uh, Mr. Fernandez, uh, it's good to see your family here. Incredibly gifted family, I must say. You've got all the bases covered. You can get educated. Your health care is going to be taken care of, and uh, that's a pretty good deal. Uh, so uh, I want to know, uh, I, I hope you've had an opportunity maybe to see what this committee did last week in a 21 to 1 vote, uh, pass out uh, the Strategic Competition Act, which is something that Senator Risch and I authored along with many members of this committee, intended to restore our global economic leadership, including passages calling on the President to work with our G7 allies in matters relevant to economic and democratic freedoms. Uh, we, we see in this committee on a bipartisan basis as China being our most strategic uh, competitor a nation that we must confront when they violate international norms, but we must also compete with. Uh, if confirmed, what will be your goals when it comes to the global economy and in its post-COVID recovery, particularly as it relates to competing uh, with China? Thank you for your question, Senator. <clears throat> and I, I commend you and the committee for the work that you did last week on the, on the, on the China bill. It, uh, it, it's... it's uh, it's an attention that, that I think uh, will be a, an important part of my role at the State Department. The fact of the matter is that, you know, uh, China is no longer biding its time. Uh, it's challenging us in the economic sphere every chance that it gets, and it's doing so through practices that are inimical to many of the rules that they had to follow in order to get to where they are, and they're trying to challenge now those rules. Uh, we have pushed back, but I think uh, we must do more and I think the, the bill that you worked on last week will, be, will give us an additional tool to do that. One of the, uh, <clears throat> the areas that I think I would like to, to concentrate my efforts on will be to working with our allies more, uh, to working with our private sector, uh, and to provide alternatives to other countries to doing business uh, with China. Oftentimes, they may not have other choices. And I think part of what we need to do is to work with our allies and to work with our companies to uh, talk to them about the opportunities abroad and to get them much more involved in international business. Thank you. I'm going to turn to Senator Risch. Uh, I'm going to uh, let Senator Risch uh, preside in this period of time. After Senator Risch, Senator Cardin is next, and then Senator Haggerty after that. But I should be back by then. Thank, Thank you, Senator Risch. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm going to uh, ask a few questions here, and then we will turn to Senator Cardin. Um, Ambassador Jenkins, uh, as you know, the United States withdrew from the uh, Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, the, commonly known as the INF Treaty. We believed it was the right thing to do, that is, the United States did, and so did NATO. NATO found that the uh, uh, U.S. was justified in withdrawing from INF. I'm, I'm told you don't particularly agree with that decision. Is that correct? Thank you, sir. Um, at the time the decision was made, my concern uh, was whether, in fact, uh, in my view, uh, we had a significant strategy as a next step after that. So that was my concern at the time. Um, do you, are you still in the same, play, uh, same spot you were? Um, I, I think that after I had time to see this, um, I'm still concerned about the strategy going forward, but I certainly understand why the U.S. withdrew. Mm -hmm. And, and, of course, uh, that was the result of the fact that uh, the treaty was a uh, one-way street. That is, we were complying, but the Russians weren't. Fair statement? Yes. Yes, Mr. President. Um, you have any plans of, of turning that around? Um, the statement or? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> 
the, the statement's a statement. I'm talking about the about the facts, about uh, trying to get them uh, back in the lane they're supposed to be in. Well, I think what we what the administration does have planned for the future, um, and if I'm confirmed, I would be hopefully involved in these kind of discussions, is a way forward to work with Russia. Uh, and the idea would be to have what they're calling strategic stability talks, in which time it would be uh, an opportunity to really look um, at all the different issues with Russia, but also we want to continue to engage our allies uh, on issues uh, in regarding Europe and NATO. Uh, so um, I think that the idea now is to have some of these discussions with our allies, and of course we'll have our discussions with, uh, with Russia. And then we'll see where we are um, after, well, after we've had a chance to start these dialogues. How about the uh, Chemical Weapons Convention and Russia's uh, compliance, or rather non-compliance? you have thoughts on that? Uh, well, the use of chemical weapons is reprehensible. Um, and I, you know, I know that the U.S. has uh, instituted sanctions against Russia as a result of the use of nuclear, uh, chemical weapons against their own citizens. Uh, the U.S. continues to make the point at the OPCW in The Hague and also to raise the, the point with our allies as well. So uh, my view is that, that use of chemical weapons is, as I said, reprehensible. I think we all agree with that. But the question is, how do you get them, uh, how do you bring them to heel uh, to comply with the uh, convention that they've subscribed to? Um, sir, you continue to use sanctions. You continue to work with our allies to put pressure on them. You continue to work with uh, multilateral organizations like the Organization uh, Prevention of Chemical Weapons. You work through the UN. Uh, you use all the tools that you have, uh, in my view, use all the tools that you have at your disposal, uh, whether they're diplomatic or others, um, to actually try to get, uh, get the Russians to uh, actually abide by what they're supposed to be doing. How about the Biological Weapons Convention? Um, the Biological Weapons Convention is, is a convention that is significant, and uh, we need to continue to put more emphasis on the Biological Weapons Convention to reinvigorate it. Uh, it's another opportunity and another way that we can encourage uh, Russia to uh, abide by things that we think they should be abiding by. And uh, what about uh, uh, nuclear testing with Russia? Uh, the concern there is, as you probably know, um, all of the uh, P5 countries, all the nuclear weapons countries, ha currently have a moratorium on nuclear testing. The concern there is if countries start to test again, it can open a box to nuclear testing. Um, we've had a moratorium for a number of years, so we want to try to prevent a situation where countries feel that that's something that they could be doing again. I'm assuming you're familiar with the 2020 State Department compliance report uh, that Russia is, in fact, violating each one of these agreements. Uh, are, are you familiar with that uh, from the agency that you're about to join that report? Um, I am uh, aware of the compliance report. Obviously, I did not have any input on that. Um, and I'll have much more time to examine it um, after, you know, of course, after I, if I'm confirmed, but after today. Are, are you in disagreement with their conclusions that Russia is uh, in non-compliance uh, and violating all of these uh, uh, conventions and treaties that uh, we've just talked about? No, I'm not. In, I would not be in disagreement with okay. that, sir. Well, I, I think that underlies the heavy lift that you have ahead of you. Um, you you've talked to me generally about that. Can you give me any more specifics on your on how you intend to uh, go down that road? Um, well, sir, I mean, I think that what we need to do is, uh, as the government is uh, planning, and I'm not there, so I can't really attest to all of the discussions that are actually taking place in our interagency, but as I said, what I'm aware of are the, uh, the next steps in terms of engaging on issues of, nu of nuclear weapons, uh, the use of sanctions against Russia that have just been done. We can continue to do sanctions. Uh, continue to put pressure on them in other ways, using the whole of government and all of the different tools that we have, um, using diplomacy, which is which we have different avenues for that, both bilaterally, multilaterally, through our multilateral organizations. Um, you know, I, I we think I think we just have to use all the tools that we have at our disposal uh, to try to convince and to push Russia to comply with with treaties. Um, in looking over some of the things that you've written, uh, I was a little perplexed on, on April 21st, 2019, uh, you wrote, and I quote here, men make nuclear weapons more dangerous, end quote. Um, I'm a little perplexed by that. How, how do I make uh, nuclear weapons uh, more dangerous? What, what, 
Um, Can you drill down on that a little bit for me? Yeah, I, I don't quite recall that statement. Um, I'm not saying I didn't make it, but out of context, I, I don't recall. Um, uh, if it's, I'd have to know which article that was, but um, I know that I have written about the importance of having diverse perspectives um, in terms of national security and foreign policy, um, in terms of having um, uh, different viewpoints, um, in terms of having uh, more women at the table. Uh, it, I assume that's that context that you're, you're pulling that from. Well, uh, the, I'm, I'm looking at it here, and the exact quote is, men make nuclear weapons more dangerous, a completed sentence. And I guess I'm, I'm just perplexed as to how men make nuclear weapons more dangerous. Well, I think what I, if, if I can recall what you're, what you're pulling it from, um, essentially what, what I'm saying there is that um, we have a situation now where um, we have to reassess where we are in terms of where we have been. Um, we need to look at bringing more different, diverse people to the table. Um, to date, we have not had enough significant diversity, um, and it has been a situation where um, it has been essentially men at the table. Um, so, it's, so it's more of an issue of uh, we need to include more di more people and more diverse people because we only know what we have right now, and we don't have that. I don't think anyone is in disagreement that uh, d diversity is uh, appropriate, but well, I just don't understand how men make nuclear weapons more dangerous. I think that's the, very I think, yeah, what, um, what you're pushing at <laughs> is that um, uh, the context that uh, that men, um, without having to make any certain statements here, that the, the belief that um, women in conflict situations, and there has been study on this, that when women at the table, that there's more peace, and peace tends to last longer. Senator Cardin, you're up. Okay, uh, we'll, go, we'll go down uh, in the list that uh, people were signed up. Uh, Senator Van Hollen, are you with us uh, by WebEx? How about? Uh, Sen uh, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Cardin, it sounds like you, but I don't see you. Uh, I think I'm now with you. Uh, thank you very much, and let me thank both of our nominees for their willingness uh, to serve in these two very important roles. In both of your testimonies, you've indicated the importance of American values in our policies. Uh, Ambassador Jenkins, you specifically said that we need a value-based policy as it relates to our arms issues. And certainly, uh, Mr. Fernandez, your family experience points out the importance of family-based policies. So I want to ask both of you a question, but first let me start with Ambassador Jenkins, and that is our arms policy needs to be based upon our values, and our values is respect for human rights. So when we get involved in arms sales with countries that allow these arms to be used uh, inappropriately against their own people or uh, to uh, deny human rights to others, uh, we should not permit that to happen. We need to, uh, to filter our, our considerations of arms sales through our human rights concerns. What commitments can we have from you that as you're at the table, as these types of decisions are being made, that in, indeed we will um, promote our values, our human rights, uh, even though at times it might run some challenges in our bilateral relations with other countries? Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Senator. Uh, yes, uh, as I said, that uh, we need to uh, look at our values, but also we need to highlight the importance of human rights. Uh, in that, uh, I can, what I am aware of is that there is now a review ongoing on our conventional arms transfer policy, uh, which will inform decisions on transfers. 
um, and that I, I, I can certainly say, if I'm confirmed, uh, that it will, things will change. It won't be business as usual. So we need to continue to uh, look at these on a case-by-case -case basis. We need to look at our national security concerns. We need to look at our strategic uh, concerns that we have in the region, region stability. Um, and we also need to continue to reassess anything that we decide to transfer uh, to another country. But ultimately, we have to consider human rights in these issues. And if I'm confirmed, I will be looking at the uh, revised uh, uh, CAT policies that are being uh, discussed right now. Thank you. I will uh, be working with you on those areas. I've introduced some legislation in this regard. Uh, and I'm glad to see it's not business as usual. Uh, it is absolutely essential that as we talk about arms sales, that uh, human rights be a, a component of those discussions. Mr. Fernandez, I, I wanna raise a subject I've raised consistently with nominees that have come before our committee. And that is the importance to standing up against corruption. Uh, we have several tools that are available uh, that are in your toolkit, including the use of the global Magnitsky statute uh, there are legislation pending uh, before this committee that I've authored on a bipartisan basis with other members of our committee that would set up a requirement that our missions evaluate every country's commitment to anti-corruption and evaluate how well they're doing, as well as making funds available uh, to fight corruption. Can I get your commitment? I've gotten this from, from, from so many of the members of the Biden administration that we will be focused in your work on an anti-corruption agenda, recognizing that corruption many times is the fuel for the anti-democratic regimes of being able to stay in power and abuse the power. Senator, thank you for your question. Uh, absolutely, you have my commitment. In fact, I, I will tell you that I've, I'm a firm believer from my time in the private sector that we're never going to outcompete other countries on uh, low environmental standards, intellectual property theft, corruption, uh, respect for human rights. It's, it's part of our DNA, it's part of, of what we are about as a country, and uh, it's also, I've seen it, I've seen it be a competitive advantage. I've seen countries say, we're gonna use an American company to build this road because we know that that contract was not obtained through uh, illicit means. Uh, so you have my commitment, and in fact, I would love to work with you some more on, on these issues. I, it's something that is, that is in, in, my, in my DNA, and I'm, I very much uh, would welcome the opportunity to discuss it further with you. Well, thank you. And again, I want to thank both of our nominees and their families. This is a tough time to serve in government. Both of your roles that you have been nominated for are critically important to our national <laughs> security and have challenges. And uh, thank you for stepping forward, and I look Mr. forward to working Mr. with both of you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Cardin. I understand Senator Haggerty is with us virtually. Yes, Mr. Chairman. You're recognized, Senator. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Risch. I appreciate your holding this meeting. Uh, my first question is for Ambassador Jenkins. Uh, thank you for being here today, Ambassador. We're in a period right now where China is ramping up its nuclear weapons capability. At the same time, Russia is articulating a strategy like Escalate to de-escalate. They're developing weapons like the Poseidon that has the capability of destroying cities. So at this time, I want to get, <clears throat> get your perspective on which way the Biden administration is going to go. And if I could, I'd like to read a couple of quotes and then get your thoughts on what direction we're going. Uh, during her nomination hearing, <clears throat> Deputy Secretary of Defense, Kath Hicks, said that the triad has been the bedrock of our nuclear deterrent. And I think it must be modernized in order to be safe, secure, and credible. Yet on April 10th of 2021, two Biden administration officials gave an interview in Japan with the Asahi Shimbun, the fundamentally different message about U.S. nuclear policy. During that interview, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for the Bureau of Arms Control, Verification, and Compliance, Alexandra Bell, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Nuclear Missile Defense Policy, Lenore Tomero said that, quote, there is no doubt that President Biden's goal is to reduce the role of nuclear weapons. So, Ambassador Jenkins, if you're confirmed, will you commit to supporting the modernization of nuclear weapons?
Thank you, sir. Um, I think I, like, like President uh, Biden, really support a safe, secure, and uh, strong nuclear arsenal uh, for as long as we do have our, our, our nuclear arsenal. And I know that this, is, uh, this has been something that we has had uh, bipartisan support. Um, I know that uh, right now uh, this is being led, issues of uh, modernization, um, are led by our Department of Defense, our Joint Chief of Staff, and uh, Department of Energy. Um, so what I can say is that uh, obviously I'm not in the government right now and knowing what's being discussed, um, but I can certainly say that if I am confirmed, I look forward to engaging with uh, our military uh, uh, components as well as Department of Energy uh, in the modernization and process. Um, and, you know, I think we can agree, as I said, it's bipartisan that we do need uh, a safe, secure, and effective arsenal. Well, help me rectify this, because we're at a time right now when China and Russia are both stepping up their nuclear programs. And you've got people in the department that, if you're confirmed, the department that you will run, who are saying that they feel that President Biden wants to see us reduce our nuclear capability. How do you square that? I think the, the way to square it is it's going to be a whole government approach in terms of how we, how we approach these issues. Um, I think having a strong uh, 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 nuclear arsenal uh, is not necessarily a contradiction uh, in terms of looking at how we can also find a way in which we can uh, safely uh, and, 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 and adequately uh, reduce our, our arsenal. Um, I think a lot will depend on what's decided in terms of how we work with countries like Russia. Um, it will determine, I assume, on, on ongoing discussions with China. Um, so I can't say because I'm not in the government, but I think that we should be able to square this by having a whole of government approach and how we look at the, all of these issues of the nuclear triad, the nuclear posture review, and also the way in which we will approach countries uh, on arms control and disarmament. Ambassador, thank you. I'll just say this. We live in a competitive world. We need to take account of what China is doing, what Russia is doing. We need not be naive in our process. So I hope you will take a very careful look at what your staff, if you should you be confirmed, are saying, and make certain that we have a consistent policy and that we're not articulating a confusion position to our own nation and to our adversaries. Can I turn now to um, a discussion that I've been looking forward to having with Mr. Fernandez? Mr. Fandez, I'd, I'd like to talk with you about the Clean Network Initiative that you and I have talked, discussed. Uh, it's been an undisputed success with some 60 countries that have already signed up. 200 companies have been involved in the Clean Network Initiative. Again, an initiative that would keep untrusted vendors out of our in infrastructure. We've talked about this in the past. It's built tremendous brand equity. And given your background in mergers and acquisitions, I'm certain you realize that that type of momentum uh, has a great deal of value, something that we'd certainly like to see captured and, and, and the momentum continue. And if you're confirmed, would you commit to working with Congress to secure the resources and any new authorities that you may need to continue to move this program forward? Senator, thank you for your question. And uh, we, had, we had a conversation uh, yesterday about this, and uh, let me repeat what I said then, which is, uh, I very much agree that the stakes couldn't be higher, that we need uh, to, to trust that, and our allies need to trust that the 5G equipment that they purchase will not threaten national security, privacy, or basic infrastructure. And the Biden administration has reaffirmed the importance of a 5G strategy. It's currently under review. We share the goal. There's been lots of progress, and it's my, it's my intent to try and further those goals. Uh, new administration, there may be some tweaks, but you have my, my commitment and you have my word that we will pursue the same goals because they involve uh, national security at its core, not just for the United States, uh, but for, for the entire world. And so uh, I look forward to working with you on that, and I would be delighted to spend some time working uh, on, on, on furthering that objective. Excellent, Mr. Hernandez, and I look forward to working with you actually taking this approach across other sectors, technology <laughs> sectors, energy sectors, uh, as we think about, uh, you know, the, the new infrastructure of the future, autonomous vehicles, et cetera, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. One follow-up question. Uh, the State Department compiled a list of 1,100 <laughs> companies that um, 
are involved in financing the PRC military. Uh, that list is very helpful to investment advisors as they think about and advise their clients on which companies to divest. Uh, when will the State Department update that list of 1,100 companies? Senator, uh, thank you for the question. I, I am not familiar with with those plans. I would be happy to get back to you on that, uh, um, but I, I I am not familiar with the uh, with that list of the, of, the, of the names that are there or the, of the plans that the State Department has to update them. I will certainly get back to you on that. Great. It's a, it's a very useful tool, and I appreciate um, the update schedule when you can get it. Thank you so much. Thank you. I understand Senator Van Hollen is with us virtually. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and, and Ranking Member, and uh, congratulations to both witnesses on their nominations. And your, thank you for your willingness uh, to serve. Uh, Madam Ambassador, I want to follow up a little bit on some of the questions that uh, Senator Haggerty raised, at least that line of questioning. I think uh, we've long agreed on a bipartisan basis uh, that our sort of strategic defense uh, depends on a reliable and effective uh, nuclear deterrent, but we've also recognized that we can uh, make ourselves safer through uh, smart arms control agreements um, with uh, previously the former Soviet Union um, and now with Russia uh, and others. And I was pleased to see that uh, President Biden uh, chose to extend the New START agreement by five years. Uh, that had some bipartisan support here. I had introduced a resolution with Senator Young uh, to encourage that, and I'm glad that the administration moved forward. And that has the support, as you know, of our military leadership as well, who recognizes who recognize that that's an important part of our stability, predictability, and verification uh, regime. Uh, but this five years will now give us an opportunity to look at follow-on uh, negotiations, strategic nuclear negotiations, or other nuclear weapons negotiations uh, with Russia. How do you anticipate moving forward on that? Uh, do you agree that we should be looking for deeper cuts in strategic nuclear weapons and looking at some of the, the, the Russian capabilities and bringing them within the uh, fold of uh, the next arms control agreement? Uh, thank you, sir. And uh... I think looking forward, um, and as I said, this is uh, something also being uh, looked at by the administration, and they're also in the process of planning uh, the next steps for uh, engagement uh, with Russia on these issues. Um, certainly, uh, I think the idea would be deeper cuts, but I think a lot of that depends. A lot of that depends on what happens with the strategic stability talks that are being planned. Uh, we certainly want to include um, discussions on some of the novel weapons that uh, Russia have. We certainly want to look at their non-strategic nuclear weapons that they have, um, of which they have a, a lot more, uh, and, and are planning to, uh, to build more of these type of weapons. So we certainly want to have a discussion in, in which we will bring in all of these weapon systems, as I said earlier, um, so we can, we can determine exactly where we need to have a conversation on deeper cuts. Um, and, as you, and as you have acknowledged, um, this will be a decision uh, by the administration, looking at all the different relevant factors, uh, including having a strong uh, nuclear arsenal. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, let me turn quickly to China. Um, yeah, while China is working to develop and modernize uh, its nuclear forces, uh, there remain big you know, differentials uh, between both the size and, and the quantitative uh, edge uh, with respect to our nuclear uh, arsenal. Uh, that doesn't mean, however, that there is not room for some negotiations uh, with China uh, to avoid to miscalculations. Could you talk a little bit about uh, your vision of how we engage with China when it comes to nuclear arms control? Um China is an important country uh, in terms of uh, nuclear arms issues. They are a, a significant threat uh, to us, uh, as we have noted earlier. Um, as noted, they are trying to increase their nuclear arsenal uh, uh, two times by, by, by the end of the year. Um, they are strengthening their nuclear triad. They are um, looking at trying uh, some novel systems. So certainly we have to find a way to, have a, to get them at the table. Um, as you know, it has, has been a challenge to do that. Um, there have been attempts to try to make that happen, but I think we have to focus on uh, results more than form. 
Uh, we do think, and I think the administration thinks, uh, that uh, a bilateral effort is the way to go. Um, and because there are certain uh, uh, security issues that I think uh, that we want to look at specifically with, uh, with China. So we want to engage them, um, and I believe the, the administration is uh, discussing next steps for to engage, uh, to engage China bilaterally uh, to try to start uh, discussions so we can prevent miscalculation, we can have more transparency, and get a much better understanding of what's happening uh, for everybody's security. Well, thank you. And um, Mr. Fernandez, uh, I, just briefly, I wanted to mention Power Africa and whether you would agree that that's a, been a very useful tool in terms of engaging with Africa and trying to accomplish some of our objectives there and whether it, it makes sense to expand the use of Power Africa. Thank you, Senator. Uh, thank you for your question. And I'm very familiar with your interest and commitment uh, to, to working in Africa. Uh, I think Power Africa has been a success. It's been a success on the renewables front. It's been a success on, on, on regulatory reform in Africa. I think we need to expand it. I think, uh, as, as I said in my opening statement, one of the benefits that we have is to, uh, in the competitive advantages that we have over countries such as China is our private sector. And we need to get our private sector involved in infrastructure in Africa. That, that may be a tall order, but I think uh, programs such as Power Africa are, are, are programs that we ought to uh, deepen. And you have my, my commitment to work with this committee to do that going forward. I have spent uh, a fair amount of time in Africa. I used to commute to Ghana for about two years privatizing its phone company. Uh, it's a country that has great potential and that it also presents a, an opportunity for U.S. business and U.S. workers. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Markey, I understand, is with us virtually. Senator Markey. Hear me, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. You're recognized. Mr. Chairman, can you hear me? I can, and you're recognized. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, uh, Ambassador Jenkins, uh, President Trump systematically dismantled the arms control architecture that you will oversee uh, as undersecretary uh, he was egged on, the President Trump, by John Bolton, uh, but ultimately President Trump tossed aside the International Nuclear Forces Treaty, the Arms Trade Treaty, the Iran Nuclear Deal, the Treaty for Open Skies, and he flirted with taking a wrecking ball to the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty by signaling an interest in conducting a, quote, demonstration nuclear test just last year. Uh, and at home, President Trump broke with his predecessors by increasing the role of U.S. nuclear weapons and military strategy by deploying a low-yield warhead on our strategic ballistic, ballistic submarines and developing a new nuclear sea launch cruise missile after President George Herbert Walker Bush retired them three decades again. So it's clear we need to build back a better nuclear posture. Uh, and so my question to you uh, is, um, are, is the Biden administration uh, uh, going to uh, carry out a review of its nuclear policy? And do you agree that every effort should be made to follow the tradition of presidents on a bipartisan basis, going back to George Herbert uh, uh, Walker Bush, uh, but exempting uh, Donald Trump? Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, it is my understanding that there is review uh, uh, taking place on the nuclear posture review. Um, there are uh, reviews uh, and interagency discussions, my understanding, on a number of issues relating to uh, arms control, relating to nonproliferation issues, um, and all the other, many of the other issues that we are discussing today. So there is a review of that. Um, and I certainly uh, look forward to and hope if I'm confirmed, that we can have a bipartisan process for going forward on all these issues uh, that are within the T Bureau, particularly the ones we're talking today about arms control uh, and nonproliferation, and finding ways uh, that we can reassert the U.S. leadership role in arms control uh, and nonproliferation. Thank you. 
Yeah, thank you. Well, in 2013, President Obama's nuclear employment guidance concluded that we could reduce our deployed stockpile by up to one third and still meet our deterrence and reassurance commitments. And I hope that's the position that uh, the Biden administration is once again going to reaffirm. Um, the Trump administration reportedly flirted with conducting the first U.S. nuclear test in over a generation uh, in a clumsy attempt to bring Russia and China to the negotiating um, table. Uh, My Planet Act last year helped to deny funds to make a good on those Dr. Strange love visions. In your view, if we were to carry out such a test, what would the consequences be to the nuclear nonproliferation regime? Uh, sir, if the U.S. Uh, if the U.S. Um, did a test, um, that would certainly uh, we certainly would not be considered uh, leaders in the nonproliferation uh, uh, area. We have we would go against our moratorium that we have on nuclear testing. Um, there would be lots of questions about why we're testing. What does that mean in the future? Um, so that would create a lot of um, confusion. Um, in the international community, it would create a lot of confusion by uh, by uh, by countries in terms of our overall role and obligations in arms control, and it certainly would not uh, bode well, in my opinion, uh, in terms of uh, our role and our position on nuclear testing. Good, thank you. And one final question: If confirmed, will you advocate for the president to recommit to the arms trade treaty? Uh, and work with members of this committee uh, to build support for future Senate advice and consent on that treaty. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, if I am confirmed, uh, I would certainly be uh, interested in conversations in, in the interagency on uh, next steps, or next possible steps for the U.S. on the Arms Trade Treaty. Okay, beautiful. Uh, thank you, and uh, thank you for your service to our country. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Schatz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you to both of you for being uh, willing to serve. Uh, Ambassador Jenkins, there was a recent DOD report in which they essentially conceded an inability to uh, track, uh, to do end use monitoring of, uh, of arms uh, uh, in Ukraine and Afghanistan. Um, we've seen American made um, so called non lethal. Uh, uh, weapons uh, used in Egypt and in Hong Kong. Um, I have a couple of questions about how we do end use monitoring. I know there's uh, a good partnership at the, at the State Department with the Department of Defense um, to track the weapons that we sell or provide to our foreign partners. My understanding is that the Security Cooperation Office at our embassies is responsible for conducting these end use checks, but often the people of the, in these offices are stretched thin. And I'm wondering if this is an area where a few more people or uh, some new use of technology could strengthen our oversight in, in terms of weapons exports. Can you comment on this and, and talk about what opportunities you see to improve um, the resources we dedicate to end use monitoring checks? Yes, thank you. Thank you, sir, for that question. Um, yes, end use monitoring is, is uh, very important in terms of ensuring that the uh, arms transfers that we believe are going where they are going actually end up where they are uh, are supposed to be. So we certainly want to do everything we can to strengthen and make sure that in-use monitoring is happening. Um, I am aware that there are cases, and uh, I can't recall which in which case at the moment, but I know that um, it's been uh, more successful. I know in some cases where countries um, have actually gone out and done uh, have done more in terms of in-use monitoring and have more agreements. Um, I think one thing that we need to do, as you said, I think we should always look at more options if there is technology that can help. Um, I think that, you know, if I were confirmed, happy to look at uh, addition, different options um, that could help us. Um, strengthening, if, if there is a need for more people to help out with that, I think that's great. Um, but I think, as, as I was saying earlier, as, as we have much more emphasis in the future on human rights, as we more have a much stronger emphasis on these issues in general in terms of where these, uh, where these arms end up, um, I am certainly open to more discussion on what we can do to make it better, uh, in particular in light of the fact that we are re-looking at our, our cap policy and everything else. So. so I think there are a couple of, a couple of areas for improvement. First of all, technology. Mm -hmm. Second of all, just 
flat out resources, you need more human beings to, to, to do this work. And then third, uh, sort of undergirding that, um, you don't want to just lay down a, a layer of technology on an old system uh, under old assumptions. And so I do think we need to do a comprehensive look and just concede it's not working right now. Um, it, it may be working to, to greater and lesser degrees in certain countries, but where it needs to work, it's, it's not working. Now, there's another question um, that I think is essential to this, which is that it's not just a geographic location of whatever um, arms have been transferred. It's it's how they're used, right? And um, and that's a policy question. I'm wondering if we can work together on that because it may be that it's in the possession of those of uh, of that country uh, that we transferred it to, but but used for something that is antithetical to our values. Mm -hmm. and, and I I think that's a more ticklish kind of difficult policy question to get to uh, because it's after the fact. But, but I still think that's our basic obligation when we think about end use monitoring. I wonder if you can comment on that. No, I think I think you're right. I think I think um, I mean obviously as you said, one 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 question is where where do the where do the arms land and the other one's how are they used. Um, you know, and and you know, giving them to a country for one purpose and you they're being used for something else. You know, it's a challenge. You know, it's a challenge to always uh, to know exactly how it's going to be used, but um, but I think that we certainly want to strengthen whatever we have uh, now to make sure that we can do that. And so I am certainly, if I'm conferring, certainly happy and ready to work with you on that. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Mr. Fernandez, just a, a final question. Um, our science bureaus play an important role in terms of our relationships uh, with the countries in Oceania. Their work is key to protecting marine resources and combating IUU fishing and, and tackling the climate crisis. But I worry that these issues get a little bit um, isolated stovepipe from the day-to-day -day diplomacy run, run out of the East Asian and Pacific Asia Bureau. Can you talk about how we can make sure that oceans and climate are elevated in our approach to Oceania so that it's, it's not that we're separating science and conservation questions from, from the sort of big boy and big girl conversation around geopolitics, but that those are one and the same, especially in those areas where when you're dealing with heads of state where climate is their main issue, right? When you have an inundated runway or you have an inability to farm or fish, uh, climate is not some secondary uh, optional conservation question. It's an existential question. But I think that our, our bureaucratic systems have to reflect um, that prioritization, particular in, in Oceania, but also elsewhere. Thank you for your question, Senator. And I, I couldn't agree with you more that this is an existential question for the, for the countries in Oceania. They are, uh, they are facing, uh, in some cases, extinction um, because of climate change. Uh, so I, I share very much your, your concern. I also think that many of them, it also cuts across a number of other areas. It, they also are targets of Chinese influence. Uh, and I, so that's another national security challenge. On the, uh, on, on the pollution front, on the, uh, uh, on the ocean, uh, uh, illegal fishing, uh, and, the, and those kinds of crimes. We have offices that are uh, all over that, and uh, I have spoken to a number of them already, and I think there's more we could do going forward. So I would very much welcome, if confirmed, the opportunity to talk to you about that, and you have my commitment that we will certainly look at those again, because I do agree with you. Uh, sometimes they do get overlooked. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I understand there are no other colleagues seeking recognition, virtually or otherwise, so I have one final question. Uh, Mr. Fernandez, uh, during my time in this committee, I uh, focused on reinvigorating the tools and instruments of our economic statecraft so that the Department of State, Treasury, Commerce, U.S. Trade Representative, and other elements of the U.S. governments are working in tandem to promote international development U.S. business opportunities and U.S. best practices for corporate social responsibility. Uh, I am amazed, you know, we, uh, we have the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, which we should, uh, doesn't allow U.S. Uh, businesses to suborn uh, some entity or official abroad. Other countries don't have that. So this has been one of Senator Cardin's passions on the question of corruption. Um, I go abroad and I see uh, the uh, Chancellor of Germany uh, with a trade mission directly engaged in trying to promote her country's uh, services and products. Uh, the, uh, until recently, 
the um, Brazilians had a very powerful economic tool uh, in their centralized effort. So my question is, what tools do we have, in your opinion, that are currently working? Uh, what tools aren't working as effectively? What additional authorities might you believe you might be need, needing? And how do we bring a whole of government approach to an economic statecraft that creates greater opportunities for U.S. companies in selling their products and services abroad, opening up more markets, also instilling the business practices that are better um, than many others uh, in the world. Uh, so it has an economic benefit here at home. We sell products abroad, our services abroad. We create jobs here at home. When we instill the right business practices, we improve governance uh, in those countries. Can you give me some insights as to how you're thinking about this? Sure. Thank you for the question. And it's a big question. Uh, and I'm glad that very much that you... That's why you're going to get paid the big bucks if you get confirmed. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm very glad that you brought it up. Um, you know, when I was here um, in, in between 2009 and 2013, I was amazed by the fact that I would go to uh, countries in the Middle East and my, you know, I would go on my regular commercial flight, and next to me would be the, the, the president of another country, and that president would come down, and right behind them was a, a number of, of, of uh, com or a number of companies, or a number of business people. It was not so much of a, a presidential uh, visit as much as a, uh, a chamber of commerce visit. Uh, we need we. We don't have that kind of ethos yet at the State Department. We're working on it, and you've given us a number of tools. Uh, I think what was done with the DFC is something that, that ups the ante and we, we can compete with, a, uh, with the Chinese and with others. We need to, and I intend to do this if confirmed at the State Department, we need to do more on the training front. Our, our State Department employees have to have economic statecraft at the forefront. Of, 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 their, of their tasks. It's got to be part of what they get graded on. Uh, and I think uh, I'd like to focus more on the training side. I think uh, getting more um, whole of government co cooperation, some of the work that has been done, for example, on deals teams, uh, that where we embed uh, economic officers in some, of the, in some of the embassies to support American business. We need to do more of that because at the end of the day, uh, international opportunities are not just a strategic imperative uh, of the United States, but it's a, it's a business opportunity for our companies, and it's, a, it's an opportunity to create better jobs. And so, if confirmed, I will, uh, I will continue my, my push to try and get economics at the forefront of what the State Department does. Well, I'm thrilled to hear you say that. I think that one of our challenges is trying to permeate throughout uh, the State Department and its uh, uh, offices, particularly our embassies abroad, the concept that economic statecraft is one of the core missions that are critical for an ambassador and their staff to promote. When I go abroad uh, and visit uh, our embassies, and they do incredible work, and our people are just uh, fantastic uh, individuals, but I don't get this, I, I hear about the political component of what's happening in the country, our, our, our bilateral relations in dimensions that are everything but economic in most cases. And having that permeate to the thought that, in fact, what we are doing to promote U.S. economic interests, which I would argue also are about good governance uh, uh, issues as well within the country, um, and better products and services for the nations uh, receiving it, is, uh, I think, a, an incredibly important element. So we look forward uh, upon your confirmation and working with you on this, because I think this is a, a critical issue. And it creates a real connection to uh, Americans to understand if my business or the company I work for gets to sell X product abroad, uh, I'm, my job here is not only more secure, but maybe more prosperous. Uh, and so that, that's something we need to do a better job of. Let me thank, oh, I'm sorry. Um, okay. Uh, so we look forward to working with you on that. Um, 
I'm going to say we have a colleague who is uh, supposedly on his way here, and um, in deference to him, I will wait. Uh, but I will say that uh, when he finishes his line of questioning, the record will remain open until the close of business Friday, April 30th. Uh, I would urge both of you, uh, there will be questions for the record. I would urge both of you to respond to them fully and expeditiously as possible so that <clears throat> excuse me, so that your nominations can be considered at a business meeting of the committee uh, and move the process uh, forward. Um, Excuse me for my moment. <clears throat> All right, I, I, I'm not quite sure when our colleague would be here and in deference to the rest of the committee, I'm sure he will be able to uh, pursue his questions for the record. Um, uh, he may call you as well. If he, I don't know if he's, uh, Senator Kane has had an opportunity to engage with both of you, but if he hasn't, I would urge you to do so. Um, and with the thanks uh, of the committee, um, this hearing is adjourned.